today we're going to talk about how to build an iconic personal brand. Your personal brand starts with the look. Your look. You don't have to be as handsome or beautiful as JFK, Tom Cruise, Elizabeth Taylor, Kim Kardashian, or any other celebrity to pull it off. In fact, you don't have to be attractive at all. No one's going to confuse Lady Gaga with a supermodel, though many a supermodel would easily change places with Lady Gaga. What you need is a look, your unique combination of fashion, style, colors, symbols, and accessories. The ones that are uniquely associated with you, your power, your talent, charisma, brand, and fame. Creating a look will make you stand out from the crowd. Yet at the same time, it makes you more familiar. Think Steve Jobs' black crew neck sweaters. Tiger Woods' red Nike shirts for victory on Sunday. Or Mark Zuckerberg's sweatshirts. It's how you expect to see them dressed, and it makes a statement about their perspective on life. It's as much a part of their brand as Lincoln's top hat and beard, Churchill's cigar, or Donald Trump's hair. In fact, let's start at the top with hair, or in some cases, lack of it, and see how famous people use it as part of their personal brands. Name some famous boxing promoters. Yep, that's right, you only know one, Don King. And you only know him because of that spiked gray afro he sported for decades while he scammed millions from Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Larry Holmes, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, and a host of others. Prior to his fame as a promoter, King was infamous for being convicted of second-degree murder. His crime? Stomping to death an employee named Sam Garrett, who owed him $600. Not the way he wanted to become famous. Still, the hair worked for him. The story of hairstyles that matter goes back as far as Cleopatra, but it was four lads from Liverpool who put hair on the front page forever. While women were cutting their hair short with pixie cuts or the inverted bob, the Beatles made their mop-top style of long hair fashionable again for men. It defined the group's image, and the term was often used in headlines describing the band. In the 1920s, Josephine Baker's jet black, slicked down, eaten crop haircut helped her achieve stardom as an entertainer in Paris. She used a thick pomade to flatten her short hair and create kiss curls on her forehead. Her look was so iconic, it came to define the entire jazz age. Adding to her fame during World War II, she was also an agent for the French Resistance. Jean Harlow, the original blonde bombshell, captivated movie audiences with her platinum blonde look, and was the childhood idol of one Norma Jean, who would later do pretty well with her own blonde look. Rod Stewart's spiky hair is as iconic as Dolly Parton's massive beehive. Bridget Bardot's disheveled, just out of bed look defines the 1960s. Buffalo Bill, General George Armstrong Custer, race car driver James Hunt, and British entrepreneur Sir Richard Branson all sport flowing long blonde locks as part of their signature style. Eminem bleached his close cropped blonde hair for that perfect slim shady look, while Bowie went for orange with his alter ego, Ziggy Stardust. Tennis ace Bjorn Borg had long hair and a feeler sweatband, where in stark contrast to his uh, arch enemy of the time, John McEnroe, who had a big perm and a red sweatband. The iconic Farrah Fawcett, long, voluminous, sun-kissed mane with a center part was the look that defined women's hair of that late era, until the Princess Di look trumpeted. Australian motivational speaker and nutritionist Susan Powter was huge in the 1990s and early 2000s with her cry of stop the insanity. An advocate of whole foods, organic and low-fat diet, along with regular cardiovascular and strength training, Powder also condemned the diet industry for ripping off consumers. 
her platinum white, close cropped hair, aggressive manner of speaking, and being barefoot while out in public became elements of her personal style and fame. Pink, the rock star, has often been seen as very adventurous with her hair and has had lots of styles, such as a fluorescent spike in pink. Uh, she had dreadlocks and even had a black skater cut at one point. Regarding her style, she told InStyle magazine, I'm eclectic, I'm a tomboy, but I'm kind of a hippie and kind of a gangster. I don't know if that's a good thing, but it is my thing. Jamaican reggae legend Bob Marley was almost as famous for his dreadlocks as his music. Marley was also known to put it all under a tea cozy hat in a multicolored beanie style called a Rasta hat. Having no hair is not necessarily a disadvantage to fame, or so it proved for actor Telly Savalas. Long before a shaved head look was popularized, Savalas rose to superstardom playing the cuddly 1970s New York detective Kojak, along with a host of forgettable movies like The Dirty Dozen. He, along with Yul Brynner of The King and I and Magnificent Seven fame, became the first bald stars to flaunt their baldness as a symbol of their manhood rather than try to hide it. Later, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of Star Trek The Next Generation made bald sexy. Suddenly, bald was in, and people who weren't bald started shaving their head to look like Michael Jordan, Seal and The Rock. Even Britney Spears got in on the act, although in retrospect, that might not have been such a great idea. Perhaps your unique look is somewhere in between uh, Farah and Kojak, like Mr. T's mohawk. I mean, who can remember any of the rest of the A-Team, but Mr. T, he had your attention. Mr. T pioneered the Mohawk in 1977 after reading an article and seeing pictures in National Geographic magazine. The Mohawk look was again copied by the early punk rockers, although they traded in Mr. T's uh, ample gold chains for safety pins instead. Perhaps you just move on as your hair decides to leave you. Tennis star Andre Agassi had huge 1980s haircut that would have done well in any glam rock band. Only problem was, it was a wig. During one match on a scorching day, it started to come loose while he was playing. And he played the entire match worrying about the humiliation of it falling off in center court. When he got home that night, he talked about it with his then wife, Brooke Shields, who convinced him to have the courage to take it off and shaved it off. He never looked back. Frank Sinatra, William Shatner, John Travolta, Chuck Norris, Charlie Sheen, and Ben Affleck are just a few of the famous toupee wearers. Sean Connery wore a toupee in all of his Bond movies, as did John Wayne in all of his movies. Wayne, though, was never bashful about wearing a toupee. He just saw it as another prop, part of his costume, and something the public expected him to wear. In private, he never wore it. Let's talk headwear. Legendary golfer Ben Hogan always wore a flat white cap pulled down low over his hawk-like eyes to keep him focused, and it suited his steely personality perfectly. World-famous golf instructor David Ledbetter adopted a straw hat and sunglasses, a look that eventually became so recognized as his, he actually made it his logo. Australian Greg Norman started a new trend on the PGA Tour by wearing a low-crowned cowboy-style hat. Rockstar Slash is instantly recognizable by his top hat, although others like Noddy Holder and Tom Petty had done it long before it became his look. Meanwhile, Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose had a red bandana, a look he may have copied from Bruce Springsteen, who sported one throughout the 80s in his Born in the USA tour. Not content to wear what anyone else had worn before, the rock group Devo designed their own hats, immortalized on the cover of their album, Devo, Freedom of Choice. French Emperor Napoleon had a keen understanding of the importance of branding, and throughout his life used imagery and clothing to convey the power and status he had. 
The hat featured in all the popular images of Napoleon was a black felted beaver fur bicomb. Traditionally, the bicomb, with its distinctive deep gutter and two pointed corners, was worn with the corners facing the front and the back. But so as to be distinguished on the battlefield, Napoleon wore the hat sideways so that anyone scanning the crowds would instantly know by his jauntily angled hat that it was the emperor. A cunningly simple but clever move to stamp his personal brand. Winston Churchill was renowned for his hats and sported many, including bowlers and top hats. But he's most often associated with a Hamburg, which, oddly enough, was German. Churchill himself once wrote a humorous essay on the subject of hats, remarking that since he did not have a distinctive hairstyle, spectacles, or facial hair like other famous statesmen, cartoonists and photographers of the day focused instead on his love of headgear. Marlena Dietrich is someone anyone interested in timeless style should study. In a silk evening gown or a tailored tux, Dietrich's look capped off with a top hat epitomized sexual prowess and radiant confidence. The cabaret singer's androgyny figured into her charm, worldliness, and Weiner era act, which she successfully later exported to Hollywood. The power look helped her become the first ever female star to earn a percentage of a film's gross. Jacqueline Kennedy was one of America's greatest style icons. The most memorable look was the classic pillbox perched on the back of her head rather than on top. She had many versions of the pillbox, which she first wore at the inauguration of her husband. The most famous is the watermelon pink one she wore with a matching pink Chanel suit on November 22, 1963, the day President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. The options for the perfect headgear are many and varied. Hulk Hogan's skullcaps, Pablo Picasso's French beret, a black Cuban-style military beret embroidered with a communist red star, was adopted by guerrilla fighter Che Guevara and still adorns the posters and t-shirts of young men around the world, despite the fact he achieved very little in his life. Charlie Chaplin's bowler hat. Bob Jobs' killer bowler hat in the movie Goldfinger. The hat was weaponized with a chakram, a circular Indian throwing weapon. And added to the brim of his hat in the movie, he throws it like a boomerang, decapitating a statue's head. Other endearing hats from movies include Indiana Jones's fedora, Sherlock Holmes' Deerstalker, and the sorting hat in Harry Potter movies. Abraham Lincoln, at six feet four inches tall, was very tall, especially for those times. The addition of his famous stovepipe top hat accentuated his height even further. Lincoln used to keep papers and speeches tucked inside his hat and would fish them out when needed, making his hat not just a natty bit of headgear, but a mobile briefcase as well. Davy Crockett had his coonskin hat, while the Cisco Kid sported a sombrero, and Tom Mix his famous ten-gallon hat. Indian Chief Crazy Horse would either go into battle with the body of a hawk against the side of his head, or a war bonnet with buffalo horns and double eagle feathers. He often wore a red blanket like a cape as well. NASCAR legend Richard Petty always swapped his helmet as soon as he got out of the car for a black cowboy hat. Petty favored the Charlie One Horse brand that would eventually put out a signature model with his name on it. In its ad, it states, NASCAR king of the road Richard Petty, known almost as much for his headgear as for his driving skills. Photogenic and eye-catching, the hat brand is also a favorite of Hank Williams Jr. and Kid Rock. Business guru and author Michael Gerber of e fame always wears a white Panama hat. For others like Cher, Lady Gaga, and the English Queen, there's no particular type of hat, but they sure have a lot of them. 
since her ascension to the throne at age 25, and the English Queen has worn over 5,000 different kinds of hats. Floral caps, turbans, full Cossack hats, and many, many more until she finally found a signature hat, variations of which she's been wearing for the past few years. For each of these famous people, a signature hat has become an integral part of their personal brand. Let's talk famous eyewear. Elton John's zany eyewear, like the massive sunglasses that spelled Zoom, heart-shaped lenses, square lenses, triangular lenses, even lenses with a gnome on them, became one of his endearing symbols. John Lennon's simple round glasses were similar to those worn by Gandhi. Given both men's commitment to nonviolence, one would have to think that this was not an accidental choice on Lennon's part. Later, John Denver, also projecting a wholesome, down-to-earth country image, adopted the same look with his glasses. Wayfarer's sunglasses emerged as a staple of Hollywood glamour in the 1960s, notably adorning the face of James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. By the end of the 60s, sales had declined, though. Wayfarer's cultural popularity was aided in the 1980s by the film The Blues Brothers. Only 18,000 pairs were sold in 1981. Then, in 1980, a young actor named Tom Cruise starred in the movie Risky Business. Throughout the movie, Cruise is seen wearing the square-shaped Wayfarer glasses. Sales for the Wayfarer sunglasses shot up by 50% thanks to Cruise sliding around in his underwear. Wayfarers were also worn around that time by many in the music business, including Michael Jackson, Billy Joel, Blondie's Debbie Harry, Madonna, Depeche Mode, Elvis Costello, and members of U2 and Queen, as well as many other movie stars like Jack Nicholson. The glasses became so famous, they even wrote about them in songs. Don Henley's 1984 song, The Voice of Summer, contained the lyric, You've got that hair slicked back and those wayfarers on, baby. Curry Hart's music video, Sunglasses at Night, shows the artist wearing wayfarers in the darkness. Wayfarers were not the only model of shades. Crews would single-handedly lift back to iconic status. Three years later, he starred as Pete Maverick Mitchell in the 1986 action movie Top Gun, wearing Ray-Ban Aviator Classics. Gold frame with green lenses. Sales again skyrocketed by 40%, and the shades today are universally recognized as the Top Gun sunglasses. In the 2017 movie, American Made, Cruz got yet another opportunity to make some shades famous. This time, Tom sports square-framed aviators by Randolph Engineering, which again enjoyed a Cruz-inspired sales bump. When you're the king, though, a mere iconic brand will not do, which is why Elvis customized his famous neo-style Nautic 14 karat gold aviators with his initials EP, custom fitted in the double bridge, and TCB, taking care of business, his catchphrase, on the temples. These babies have swagger written all over them. Said his wife Priscilla, we were shopping on Sunset Boulevard in 1979, and we walked into a store that sold sunglasses. Elvis was trying on different shapes, and Dennis, the owner, showed him the pair that would look right for his face. He told Elvis that the shape was good because it covered his eyebrows, and that when picking out a pair of sunglasses, that should always be considered. Elvis always stayed with the same style, unless, of course, he was in a movie. Make sure you get the right shades for your face, because your future is so bright, you're going to need them. Let's talk grooming. It's astonishing how many famous men are defined solely by their facial hair. Salvador Dali, Clark Gable, Errol Flynn, Buffalo Bill, Sean Connery in the post-Bond era, Charlie Chaplin, Groucho Marx, Tom Selleck, Burr Reynolds, Rolly Fingers, Sam Elliott, and many more. Tom Selleck's magnum P.I. Blue Bloods mustache is the epitome of a perfect chevron mustache. 
The chevron refers to the area between the nose and the upper lip, out to the edges of the upper lip, but no further. It's a mustache masterpiece. It's thick, it's luxurious, it's well-shaped and groomed. It's basically everything you could ever look to be in a mustache. A close second was actor Burt Reynolds, whose mustache was both commanding and debonair, bushy yet streamlined, and perfectly matched by his often open, hairy chest. Queen's lead singer Freddie Mercury was another chevron wearer, as was the long-running British TV host Bruce Forsyth. Athletes, too, loved the chevron. Steve Prefontaine, one of the few middle-distance runners to ever gain fame, was a chevron man, as was NASCAR king Richard Petty, Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps. May now have more medals than Mark Spitz, but Mark Spitz's mustache could beat him in any pool. Anytime Hollywood needs a cowboy mustache, also called a horseshoe, they call Sam Elliott, and he comes with it. World-famous horse trainer Pat Pirelli has a macho cowboy look that would make the Marlboro Man jealous. Blue jeans, leather chaps, cattleman's hat, flannel shirt, and of course, a mustache that most real cowboys, other than maybe Wyatt Earp, could only dream of. Another friend, Master Bill Clark, is an icon in the martial arts industry, both as a fighter and as a businessman. For over 40 years, wherever he goes, his Fu Manchu mustache went with him. The Van Dyke is a style of facial hair named after the 17th century Flemish painter Anthony Van Dyke. A Van Dyke specifically consists of any growth of both a mustache and a goatee with all the hair on the cheeks shaven. It was sported two centuries later by Buffalo Bill and later again by Colonel Sanders of Chicken Fame. Members of the rock group ZZ Top were defined by their long beards. Guitarist Billy Gibbons and Dusty Hill have been wearing the signature look since the late 70s, while funnily enough, the group's drummer, who's named Frank, prefers to remain clean-shaven. At the height of their fame, Gibbons and Hill were offered $1 million to cut off their facial hair, but they declined. Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali's legendary mustache mirrored his artistic nature. Then there's the toothbrush star mustache worn by Oliver Hardy and Charlie Chaplin. While I hate to even give Hitler the courtesy of a mention, his mustache was pretty famous. Clark Gable's pencil mustache doesn't give it down, which is probably why Sean Penn also adopted it. Australian film star Errol Flynn had a swashbuckling mustache that could make even tights look good on a man. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the walrus, a bushy style often covering the mouth, was sported by such notables as writer Mark Twain, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, and actor Wilfred Brimley. Rolly Fingers was a pitcher for the Oakland A's, and in his day, the most recognized player in the entire league thanks to his waxed handlebar mustache, which he originally grew to get a $300 bonus from athletics owner Charlie Finley. On the first day of spring training for the 1972 season, Reggie Jackson showed up with a beard, which was against club policy. In protest, Fingers and a few other players started going without shaving to force Jackson to shave off his beard in the belief that management would also want Jackson to shave. Instead, Finley, ever the showman who would do anything to sell tickets, offered prize money to the player who could grow and maintain the best facial hair until opening day. Fingers went all out for the monetary incentive offered by Finley and patented his mustache after the images of players of the late 19th century. By the time Mustache Day rolled around, all 25 members of the Oakland Athletics were sporting mustaches. Even Dick Williams, the manager, decided to grow one. To further promote the team's new look, every fan that showed up at the Oakland Stadium wearing a mustache gained admittance for free. 
the players would become known as the Mustache Gang. Most of the players shaved their mustaches off after leaving the A's, but Fingers maintained his after signing with the San Diego Padres as a free agent in 1977 and still has his famous mustache today. Let's talk body parts. Some people are just naturally beautiful, like Sophie Loren, Pierce Brosnan, Ronaldo, Annika Kornikova, or Halle Berry. For those less fortunate, their best option may be to go with just a part of their body, like Arnold's muscles, Bruce Lee's abs, Mick Jagger's lips, Gene Simmons' tongue, Spock's ears, even if they were fake, Gerard Dapperdue's nose, and Bob Hope's nose, Seal's facial scars, Mike Tyson's tattoos, or David Beckham's tattooed body, 50 Cent's gold teeth, Princess Charles's big ears, Van Gogh's missing ear, not recommended, uh, Sinatra's blue eyes, Elvis's or Shakira's hips, John Holmes' penis, or Dolly Parton's breast. All those features played major roles in their personal brands reaching iconic status. You've all heard the term, fake it until you make it. This next example takes that to new highs or possibly new lows. Porn star Long Dong Silver, famed for the size of his penis, reportedly 24 inches, appeared in many porn movies during the late 1980s. Later, photographer Jay Meyerdahl revealed that although Silver was very, very well endowed, a good 9 or 10 inches, the penis featured in his porn shots was actually fake. At first, using complicated multi-exposure techniques to enhance Silver's natural endowment for still photography, Meyerdahl persuaded the makeup artist for the film The Elephant Man to create a very realistic prosthetic which greatly contributed to the notoriety of Long Dong Silver. Apparently, no one ever caught on to it, and a generation of men was left feeling more inadequate than ever. The 70s kicked the cult of fame into high gear. For the first time, actors became more famous for the parts they played than for who they actually were, and their costume and clothing actually mattered. Sean Connery and his black tuxedo he amply filled became James Bond. Detective Columbo, played by Peter Falk, had his famous raincoat. John Travolta, in his white suit, danced his way to stardom as Tony Manero in Saturday Night Fever. The Fonz, played by Henry Winkler in the long-running TV series Happy Days, had his black leather jacket. A jacket so famous, it resides in the Smithsonian Museum, alongside Ollie's boxing gloves, Dorothy's red slippers, and Captain Kirk's communicator. Meanwhile, back in the UK, Richard Branson became the first celebrity CEO to opt for blue jeans over a traditional Savile Row suit, at least when he wasn't a damsel in distress for charity, or a pirate for publicity, or a spaceman simply because he can. Clothes make a man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. So said Mark Twain. Twain, of course, was right, unless you happen to be Linda Lovelace, Marilyn Chambers, Ginger Lynn, Jenna Jameson, Tracy Lords, Ron Jeremy, or John Holmes, who all became superstars in the 70s and 80s in the video porn business, wearing absolutely nothing at all. I looked all the names up, honestly. Just imagine how much they must have saved on clothes. But for most of us, clothing is a critical part of our look. The closest thing to nothing at all in the real world, if you could call the Playboy Mansion in the real world, would be Playboy founder Hugh Hefner. Hef managed to live his entire adult life in his pajamas, a silk dressing gown, slippers, and a white captain's cap that looked like he just walked off the set of Gilligan's Island. And of course, his ever-present pipe. President John F. Kennedy had many subtle ways of asserting his image, power, charisma, and style. Breaking with tradition of the day, he was the first president to wear European-style suits with two buttons rather than the traditional three-button American suits. 
This fashion statement added to the existing public perception that the Kennedy White House had style, pizzazz, and energy. Within months, thousands of top executives across the country had followed his lead. There was a practical reason for the suits as well. They hid the back brace he wore constantly to alleviate chronic back pain. The Armani or Baroni designer suits of the 1980s and 90s were a trend started by the film American Gigolo, starring Richard Gere. This film not only epitomized the masculine style of the day, but also drew attention to men's fashion in a way no other movie had before. The Armani suits Gear wore put the fashion house on the map. Later, movies like Wall Street with Michael Douglas played a big part in setting the fashion trends of power suits and power ties. Baroni suits had been worn by celebrities since the 1950s, including by stars such as Clark Gable, John Wayne, Gary Cooper, and Henry Fonda. But Baroni only became famous when the suits were worn impeccably by the classically handsome Pierce Brosnan in all of his Bond movies, and by Daniel Craig in Casino Royale. Legendary golfer Gary Player stood out from the crowd by being the Black Knight. Player originally wore white outfits to redirect the sun and keep cooler, but he changed to all black, and when he did, he told reporters he did it to absorb the sun's energy. But the truth of the matter was, it made him easily identifiable, even at a distance. Eventually, it became his trademark. A similar style also worked for Johnny Cash, so much so that he also became known as the Man in Black. Trump used his red power tie to great effect throughout his career as a property developer. Elvis wore leather jumpsuits, while Prince was associated with the color purple, as were Roman empires. Gandhi made the white toga famous again 2,000 years after the Greeks and Romans did while Clint Eastwood, the man with no name, had his brown, poncho, and ever-present cigar. Before his tragic death in a plane crash, golf superstar Payne Stewart's colorful 1920-star cap and knickers made him a standout among an army of PGA clones. He adopted the style in the early 1980s after walking onto the practice tee one morning and finding six other players all dressed exactly as he was, in white shoes, red golf slacks, and a white shirt. Stewart's father, a furniture salesman, gave him this advice. Always stand out from the crowd. That way, people will always remember you. With that in mind, Stewart switched to a cap and knickers, sometimes called plus twos. He was rewarded almost immediately with a lucrative contract from the NFL the terms of which required him to use the colors of the NFL team most popular in the area currently being visited by the PGA Tour. More lucrative opportunities came his way because he stood out from the other players. Stewart ignored the jibes from his fellow pros and maintained that the outfits were cooler and more comfortable to wear than regular golf slacks in the heat. They were certainly cool for him and for the legions of fans that will always remember him as much for the way he's dressed as for his outstanding play, humor, and competitive personality. Let's take a look at some possible professional applications of these ideas. A Swedish realtor in Delray Beach, where a lot of Swedes reside, might dress in the blue and yellow colors associated with the national flag as a subtle way of gaining instant rapport with clients and standing out from the hordes of other realtors. A lawyer might dress in a light-colored Panama suit to stand out from the crowd in the court in dark suits. An accountant in San Francisco might go with jeans and a t-shirt to bond with the high-tech millennials, perhaps t-shirts with different humorous accountant slogans on them. A dentist providing happy smiles might opt for a Hawaiian shirt instead of the traditional white or light blue overalls, or have something fun printed on the overalls. These days, you can get something printed on anything. The fishing charter captain who wears a bowler hat instead of a regular captain's hat. A gym instructor who wears his army uniform for fitness boot camps. 
Let's talk a little about the evolution of a look. Most of the examples I've given you focus on core elements of style. No pop diva has reinvented her fashion image with the consistency and creativity of Madonna. She emerged on the scene in the early 80s as a street smart boy toy. Over the course of her long career, she evolved into a fashion forward icon whose sense of style has become as influential as her chart topping tunes. Mostly, what Madonna wears is an evolution of what is relevant at the time, said her stylist of over 20 years, Ariana Phillips. The visuals reflect the music in a kind of seamless marriage of her point of view, she said in an interview with Billboard magazine. Somehow, Madonna carries off the cowgirl, medieval princess, virgin bride, and cheerleader looks, even with cone shaped bras, without missing a breath. But keeping up with her might leave you and your credit card a little breathless. When I started out in the martial arts business in the 80s, everyone wore either white or black karate uniforms. Nothing else. I wore a gray one, and later I switched to a blue one. I stood out a mile. When I started my company, Legendary Marketing, in 1998, I decided to use orange as our signature color. It was bright. It stood out. And at the time, I couldn't find one major company using orange. It worked. Some partners and prospects alike were calling our bright orange polos legendary orange. As I grew into a marketing legend, I opted for a bright blue pinstripe suit, bright yellow shirt, and a starry night tie for my more professional engagements. As my brand grew, though, I got more casual and eventually opted for blue jeans, a bright custom shirt, blue gator shoes, a colorful sports jacket, which together with longish hair, a Union Jack face BRM watch, and blue Oakley sunglasses, my look is in stark contrast to the rest of the very conservative golf industry. There must be something to it, though, because often when I go out, strangers ask me, are you famous? To which I reply, I'm a legend in my own mind, but you've got to start somewhere. You are what brands you're seen to use. Many stars become so attached to a brand as to become one with them. Golfer Jack Nicholas played his entire career with a giant green and white McGregor golf bag, signaling to the world the clubs he swung. Tom Watson spent his glory days with a similar sized white bag emblazoned with a giant ram's head in red, holding his weapons of choice, golden ram irons. Golfer Jordan Spieth became the first megastar to be the brand leader for Under Armour. Tiger and Nike were joined at the hip. Basketball star Michael Jordan and Jordan's air shoes are still flying high through the air long after he's retired. Bruce Springsteen has his Fender Caster guitar. While Gibson was the choice of Bob Marley, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin, and Slash of Guns N' Roses. Roger Federer plays with a Wilson racket. Novik Djokovic and Andy Murray play head. Rafael Nadal, Babylon. And then there was Borg. 1970s tennis star Bjorn Borg played with a Donny racket and seemingly had it all. Long blonde hair, a headband, facial hair, and a series of outfits that became as famous as he was. When it comes to sportswear logo, Fila's rounded F is only slightly less iconic than the triple stripes of Adidas were long before Nike and Under Armour even existed. Fila's CEO, Enrico Frenchy, spotted a young Borg playing in a tournament in Monte Carlo and was impressed by what he saw. Frenchy wanted to make him Fila's poster boy, and in 1975, the Bjorn Borg and Fila collaboration became a reality. Frenchy let Pierre Luigi Ronaldo design a completely new charismatic look for the aspiring youngster. The outcome was the legendary Fila pinstripe polo shirt. Bo Borg started wearing it in 1976, and it soon became the defining look of the 70s. It did not hurt that Borg grand slammed his way into sports history, wearing the Fila crest on his chest, capturing five Wimbledon titles in a row. Less than a decade later, 
the logo resurfaced as an urban symbol of the New York's burgeoning hip-hop scene. There was even a band called the Fila Fresh Crew. Forty years later, the vintage styles remain the company's best-selling items. In an odd twist of fate, Borg now runs his own clothing line, which started out as an underwear brand. A gentleman's choice of timepiece says as much about him as does his Savile Row suit, so said James Bond author Ian Fleming. Time, precious time. Golfers Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas both wore Rolex watches and had long-term affiliations with the company, as did many iconic sportsmen from Jackie Stewart to Roger Federer. It was actor Paul Newman, though, who, like Cruz and his sunglasses, took a dying watch model and made it iconic by simply putting it on his wrist. In 2018, his 1968 Rolex Daytona, a gift from wife Joanne Woodward, which was bought for around $200, sold for over $17 million. Steve McQueen's personal choice of watch was a Rolex Submariner, always worn on his right wrist. But the watch he was most closely associated with was the Tag Hula Monaco. Jack Hula launched the square-cased, water-resistant Monaco in Basel in 1969. Always ahead of the pack, Hewler forged a strong partnership with race car driver Joe Schiffen to promote the brand within Formula One. On hearing that friend McQueen wanted an authentic watch for his new film Le Mans, Schiffen naturally suggested he wear a Hewler. Jack Hewler was invited to display several models. You'd think that the producers would go with a watch like the Auto Viva, which was Schiffer's favorite model. But they needed three, and the only model they had three of was the Monaco. Thus, the film and watch history was made. My choice of watch is a BRM, Bernard Richard Manufacturing. As you can see, it has the Union Jack, which helps display my British heritage. And with the blue band, it goes with pretty much everything I wear, since my favorite color is blue. Ian Fleming, author and originator of the world's most beloved spy, wore a Rolex Explorer, as did Bond when he made his novel debut. When Sean Connery played Bond in Dr. No, he had a Submariner on his wrist, and it stayed there for most of the Bond movies. By the time product placement had taken over from personal choice, Pierce Brosnan as James Bond sported an Omega Seamaster, and Daniel Craig continued the relationship. Before he discovered Hubold, Jay-Z rapped about both Rolex and Piaget. Putting all the pieces together, all of these examples are part of the DNA code for creating an iconic personal brand. Symbols of power, mystery, action, beauty, and adventure are traits others aspire to emulate. These various symbols and icons are often copied, enhanced, and reborn by others to enhance their image and impress their fans. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's evil can evil. Lots of young men do daring or stupid things on motorbikes, but there was a time when only Ali and Elvis were as famous as a daredevil evil can evil. With his stars and stripes, leather jumpsuit, large, EK initial cowboy belt, superhero's cape, and diamond-studded walking stick, which had a hidden compartment for wild turkey. Knievel's look was part Elvis, part Liberace, and part Superman. Crowds loved it, and Knievel crafted his brand into an iconic status with the self-promotion skills of P.T. Barnum and Harry Houdini combined. To get ahead of other motorcycle stunt people who were jumping animals or ponds of water, Knievel started jumping cars, first with a Norton bike and then more famously with a Harley Davidson XR750. He began adding more and more cars to his jumps. Then he would return to the same venue to get people to come out and see him again jump even more. Testament to his lasting fame came in 2017, where the jumpsuit and cane that Knievel wore to jump 50 cars in Los Angeles 
sold for over $200,000 at auction. My good friend and business partner, Lyndon Pirelli, married to Pat Pirelli, mentioned earlier, has her own unique brand in the equestrian world. While Pat is the iconic Western cowboy, Linda's focus is on English and dressage. Her natural beauty and blonde hair is enhanced with her ever-present visor and ponytail. Her preferred colors are turquoise or black, and her belts are large with a little bling. And when not in designer blue jeans, she has colored jumpers which stand out from everybody else in the equestrian world. While one or two of these key ingredients might be the key to your look, the subtle use of many of them will make more impact since different fans will be attracted to different elements of your style. From rock stars to realtors, entrepreneurs to athletes, having a personal style, color, signature, gesture, or accessory can help build your personal brand quickly bringing the additional opportunities and income along with it. Einstein was defined by his cloud of gray hair, Dolly Parton by her beehive and bust. What style of hair would make you rock? Then there's the all-important face, or in Sam Elliott's case, the thing that's attached to his mustache. Many famous people like Charlie Chaplin, Tom Selleck, Burt Reynolds were defined by their mustaches. In some stars, often a certain part of their face or body becomes their signature, like Barbara Streisand's nose, Mick Jagger's lips, or Prince Charles's ears. Gandhi had his simple white garment. Elvis, Evil, and Liberace had their bling jumpsuits, while Tiger wore red on Sundays. Care should be taken with glasses, hats, and shoes to maximize your appeal. Accessories like watches and jewelry are also an important statement that does not go unnoticed by fans. Famous people at the top of their game understand the effect of using these seemingly insignificant styles, symbols, colors, and gestures as a way to increase their power, charisma, and personal brand. You must do likewise by coordinating all of these elements into creating a look that is uniquely you. So, what's your unique signature look going to be? What's your unique hairstyle going to be? What kind of shape? What kind of cut? What kind of color? What's your preferred headgear? Is it a visor? A hat? What about glasses and shades? What colors? What shapes and styles work for you? Personal grooming. To have facial hair, not to have facial hair, a mustache, a beard, sideburns, what works for you? Do you have any unique body features that you want to be known for or that you can use to your advantage? What about makeup? Clothes type, stylish, casual, punk, sophisticated, conservative, playful, what styles work for you? What styles are going to make you stand out in your particular market? What colors look best on you? What brands do you like? What brands would be different in the market you're in now? What about shoes? What kind of shoes do you wear that make you stand out and be noticed? What style of watch is your preference? And what accessories will tie together your look perfectly? Don't forget to go to your